I want to talk to you this evening about um, something that's very dear to the heart of the Holy Spirit, which is the majesty that belongs to Jesus. You know, the Bible says in John 16 that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of disclosure. He takes everything that belongs to Jesus and he makes it real to us. And one of those things is majesty. So I want to talk to you about the identity of majesty and how majesty changes us. If we're to walk with God in the fullness of all that he is within himself, then we must obey the relational word to give him the preeminence in all things. And that's in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, it says, he also is the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning. He is the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first, get soaked in majesty, we are marinated in majesty, so that we are saturated in the whole thought process about majesty and how sovereign Jesus really is. Ephesians 1.19 says that you would have a spirit of wisdom and revelation that you will know what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe in accordance with the strength of his might. So important, what we're learning in these days is that how to walk in the strength and how to have a focus on his exalted self so that our worship even can take us to a place of exaltation. <clears throat> and here's the thing why we want you to enter into a new um, place of worship while you're here is because we believe worship is expansive. Worship has so many levels to it. And it's really important that you keep progressing through the levels of praise and thanks and um, worship and adoration and rejoicing. That we get through the different levels and we come to a place where it's easy for us to exalt in the Lord. To really be so celebratory in life that our very lifestyle is one of exaltation. It's important in our daily life. It's important in our connection with God. It's important when we come into contention with the enemy. And, I, and you know, you're all here because we hope you will come into contention with the enemy. And we hope you'll enjoy it. And we'll hope you really understand the majesty that belongs to you. Because what sets us apart from other people in the earth is that we are not afraid of the darkness. We're not afraid of the horror of the enemy. We're not afraid of warfare. We're up for it. Because it's not like we're going to lose any day. Right? So we're learning a majesty that's catching. And we're learning part of that majesty is exulting in worship to go to the highest place of delight and jubilation and to celebrate, to jump for joy, to shout out loud about who Jesus really is, to exult in the face of the world and in the face of the enemy. <coughs> in majesty, the joy of the Lord becomes our strength. And we are changed when we connect with majesty as a life force. One of my favorite people in the Bible is Caleb, who became a man of a different spirit because majesty was more real to him than the giants that were in the land they were trying to inhabit. Not so with 10 of the other spies who went out with him. And if you, if you read... Um, the story in Numbers chapters 13 and 14. Uh, you read the story of um, how 10 spies went out, 
12 spies went out, 10 of them came back with a report so bad that the rest of Israel wanted to go back into Egypt. You know it's really bad when you're manifesting over vegetables. You know, like you're, you're salivating about the vegetables back in Egypt, you know, the leeks and the lettuce and the cucumbers and that's really bad when suddenly you are turned from being a carnivorous being into a vegan. That's not good. With apologies to any vegan that's here, especially my personal assistant. <laughs> when suddenly you become a vegetarian because you're so scared of moving forward, you'd rather go back and eat veg for the rest of your life. Something's off. Something's off. And so, the, so Caleb stands up and says, we can surely overcome. And the 12, 10 spies came back and said, we can't overcome. We were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And then Israel is so um, impoverished by the report that they make a decision that, you know, we're going to die. We need, we need to choose leaders to take us back into Egypt. It's like they would, I don't get it, they would rather go back into Egypt where the enemy is going to make, you know, um, he's going to feature the fact that they've come back. He, they're not going to go back and live. The very worst is their slavery is going to be worse than before. But the enemy is going to want to make an example of them. Because the way they come out caused you know, Egypt so many problems they're not going to live if they go back. So it's like, we're going to die if we go there. We're going to die if we go back there. Well, why not die going into something rather than die avoiding it? And that's an important word for us right now because, you know, to move into the things that God really wants for us could be very expensive in terms of relationships, in terms of church and so on and so forth. It could be costly. But that's not the way you count cost. You have to count the cost of not going into something, which is usually way more expensive. So, <clears throat> and in the face of Israel wanting to go back, Joshua and Caleb stand up and say, if the Lord is pleased with us, he'll give this land to us. Don't rebel. Don't fear the people. They will be our prey. Their protection is removed. God is with us. We can do this thing. And no wonder then that God looks at Joshua and Caleb and he says about Caleb, he's a man of a different spirit. I like that boy. He's a man of a different spirit. And so... Out of all the men over the age of 20, only Joshua and Caleb went into the promised land. And Joshua was the leader that took them in. You see, the, here's a key for you, is that majesty understands greatness in power. It's important that we all understand the level of the power that God wants to make available to us. And when you have a mindset like Caleb, based in majesty, rooted in majesty, majesty opens you up to the greatness of God's power to the point where you feel, I can't lose this fight. It is impossible for me to lose this fight fight. I don't care what the circumstances are. I don't care who's against us. If God is for us, who can be against us? One person walking with God is always in the majority because he's that big. And so uh, that when majesty is in your mindset, it becomes your mind frame, then you begin to enter into that space with God where everything becomes possible because of who God is for you. You're so utterly convinced that God can do it that there's no possibility of losing. And so what majesty does, it takes away fear as a possibility for life. It takes away anxiety and worry and panic. It banishes those things for the rest of your life. 
It's a mindset that's learning by experience that Jesus is head over all things to the church. Let me read you something that's actually in the Bible. Ephesians 1.18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and in all. In chapter 3, verse 14, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or even think, according to the power that works in us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. The language in scripture about Jesus is so strong, so powerful. Even the reading of it, these are verses that you can't read inside yourself. You have to read them out loud. You have to... Your, your voice has to be in tune with your spirit. That when you read it out loud, you feel the power. You feel the scripture resonating with your spirit. And something gets touched off on the inside of you. I like reading the Bible. I love reading the Bible out loud to the Lord. I mean, I know he wrote it and everything but he likes me reading it. I think he likes my accent. <laughs> so here's the thing. Majesty is an eye-opener. It's that big. It kind of makes your eyes go really big and round because suddenly you're faced with something so huge that it's actually bigger than the world that you're standing on. It's big. It's all-encompassing. It's all-embracing. And it makes our perceptions so powerful that confidence and faith become normal. You know, I'm so waiting for the day when the church really gets it about confidence and faith. And we have to stop doing the juvenile stuff of talking to people about fear and anxiety and worry and blah, blah, flipping blah because I'm so over it because it's just so, it's such a low level spirituality. When God wants to raise us up above those things so they're not, they don't even figure in our thinking. There is a place in Jesus where it is impossible to be fearful or anxious or worried because trust and faith, because we're so connected to the majesty of God that all we can ever see is his sovereignty and you find yourself living in that space with him 
where you look around and nothing's difficult. Is anything too hard for the Lord? So it's a, it's a mindset that transforms us. That's why Romans 12, 2 says, we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. And once our mind comes into alignment with the way that God really, really is in himself, it elevates us to a place where the enemy, therefore, cannot touch us. And it seems to me that, you know, on the levels of power, you know, we're learning, first of all, how to walk in victory, which means we're learning how to stand, which means we're learning how not to give up the territory that God's actually given us. So when the enemy comes in, the first thing you do is learn how to stand. It's like, you know, my daughter would go, what? <laughs> what? You're learning how to stand. Now, I'm not backing off. This is my place. This is my space. This is what I believe. And I'm not backing off from what I believe. So we learn how to stand. And then you learn how to press in. And you learn how to walk. Because it's not enough just to hold the piece of ground that God gives you initially. What if he wants to give you more territory? You've got to bear in mind that you are connected with a territorial spirit the one true, great, original, territorial spirit who loves to take territory, who loves to give land. There's, you know, there's some land out there that's got your name on it in Jesus. And you need to go and collect it. You need to live in it. You need to occupy it. You need to hold on to it. You need to make it work for you. So overcoming is where we take the next piece of territory that God wants for us. And then we take the next piece of territory. And in the course of that, as we begin to take territory, we start to occupy that territory. That doesn't mean that you just fight for it and then move through it to the next piece. It means you actually occupy that ground. And the territory for you is your calling. It's the vision that God has for you. And so you occupy that ground and you explore that ground and you occupy your calling and you make sure that you fill up your space with all the promises, the favor, the blessings, the anointings that God wants you to have because when God gives you territory, he wants you to build on it. And he wants you to build something huge. That's why I always believe that territory always involves money. It involves anointing and calling and vision. That's a given. But it involves money. It involves property. It involves resources. Because God wants you to build on it. God wants you to build a place for him. God wants you to build something on it. And he wants you to build something that looks spectacular. A person who wants majesty, you know, has to come to a place where faith and confidence is the norm. And you can't be shaken out of that. In the face of fear and unbelief, a person experiencing majesty will always step into their own inheritance with the Lord. Because at the end of the day, it's not just you getting your needs met. That's the baby end of life in the spirit. The mature end of life in the spirit is God wants to give you your inheritance. You know, but there's two things that the Lord is doing with us. Eh? First of all, he's teaching us how to trust him. And secondly, he's bringing us to a place where he can trust us. God wants to give us things. But he, he won't give it to you if you lose it. He'll give it to you once you've demonstrated that you can hold on to it. You have to prove that you've got it, that you're holding on to it, that it's yours. And when you have proven it, then we're, we want you to go to the next level of your development. 